I'm uh, uh, Chris Fanta, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Partners Asthma Center's Asthma Grand Rounds, the first of the 2021 season. And we're here in the Bornstein Amphitheater at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is empty. And uh, we're delighted to have you participate by live webcasting. And I want to remind you that we um, eager for your participation through questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and I uh, have shown here on this first slide how to submit a question. Just text it to me at 617-513-6043. And at the end of the presentation, we'll uh, address your questions. And if you're interested in CME credit, very simply send an email to cfanta at partners.org with your name and uh, uh, degree and email address, and uh, uh, we'll submit it to Harvard Medical School on your behalf. And just lastly, if there are any technical problems that come up uh, during this hour, you uh, can address them by sending an email to this uh, uh, link, bwhwebcasttroubleshooting at partners.org. But I hope there won't be any problem. So I'm eager for today's presentation. I've been waiting to hear a discussion of this topic for quite some time. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to in, uh, on bronchial thermoplasty for asthma. And I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be presenting. Uh, Dr. Majid Shafiq is an interventional pulmonologist and medical director of the Brigham's uh, Bedside Procedure Service. And Dr. Elliot Israel is allergist and pulmonologist and uh, director of the Asthma Research Center at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And both have direct uh, personal experience with bronchial thermoplasty. So what a great uh, pair of presenters to discuss a balanced view of the role of bronchial thermoplasty in asthma. Majid, you're first. Great, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. As an interventional pulmonologist, I will talk about sort of the pro aspects of bronchial thermoplasty. No conflicts of interest. And sorry if you see that my breath is a little, um, because I just walked in, I just rushed in after um, answering a patient phone call. So here's an outline of uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, first, uh, you know, we'll sort of review the landscape of asthma. Then we'll delve into the scientific basis for thermoplasty. Then we'll look at the clinical evidence for thermoplasty. And then finally, my personal thoughts about it as well. Okay, so you know that asthma has a, you know, is a huge public health problem in not only the U.S., but really across the world, with millions of adults within the U.S. alone suffering from asthma. And out of these, um, a significant proportion has severe asthma as well. Furthermore, asthma is here to stay. It's going nowhere. The prevalence actually has been increasing steadily over the past several decades. And the current standard of care is unfortunately not working for many of these patients. We know that problems abound with the current um, you know, status of asthma medications. Poor inhaler technique is very common, not just among kids, but among adults too. And many patients simply cannot afford their medications. That's actually even more true for certain racial and ethnic groups. For patients with severe asthma, even being on three or more controllers may not be enough to uh, mitigate their symptoms. And all of this leads to a huge burden of healthcare utilization and costs in, in the form of millions of unscheduled office visits, emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and, and several deaths as well. And altogether, the healthcare costs related to asthma care are estimated at over 50 billion every year. Importantly, the vast majority of that comes from severe or poorly controlled asthma. So with that, suffice to say that for many of our beloved patients with asthma, 
unfortunately, what we currently have to offer is not really working. When that happens, I'm sure every pulmonologist would think of, how can my friendly interventional pulmonologist come to rescue? As I'm sure you would for any other pulmonary issue, hopefully. Well, let's look into bronchial thermoplasty. What does this entail? Basically, it comprises a radio frequency controller that will transmit heat energy to a flexible catheter. Now, this catheter is something you can insert through your flexible bronchoscope, and it has an expandable wire basket at the distal tip that you can use to touch the walls of distal airways and transmit that same heat energy to heat up your airway wall to 65 degrees Celsius. The way we typically do this is to um, treat all accessible and viewable visible airways that are distal to the main stem bronchi. And we typically perform this procedure in, um, in, in, in three sort of sections. Uh, first, we treat the right lower lobe. Three weeks later, we would bring the patient back to treat the left lower lobe. And finally, three, months, uh, three weeks thereafter, you would bring them back to treat both of the upper lobes. Traditionally, we spare the right middle lobe. Um, there's no huge reason, there's no compelling reason, but it's thought to, because of the long um, lobar bronchus that is so narrow, typically for right middle lobes, uh, it is thought that this way we could prevent uh, lots of mucostasis and atelectasis of the right middle lobe. So this schematic sort of just shows what I talked about, right? You can see that catheter getting passed out of the bronchoscope. That expandable wire tip just got expanded. And now I'm going to deliver some heat energy onto that segment of this airway wall and then pull this catheter back ever so slightly to treat the adjacent section. The idea is to really treat all visible segments of the airway wall distal to the main stem bronchi, like I said. So how does bronchial thermoplasty help? How does this translate into clinically meaningful outcomes? Well, we do know from several studies that bronchial thermoplasty induces several histopathological changes in the airways. One of them is a reduction in airway smooth muscle mass. Um, and there's been some studies on animal models, on, on healthy human controls, and then more recently, uh, the TASMA study just got published in the Blue Journal. Uh, hasn't been, uh, hasn't come out in press yet, but it's, uh, it's available online ahead of print. And it shows that the median airway smooth muscle mass uh, decreased by greater than 50% at the six-month mark uh, versus no change in the control the, you know, in patients that were, and these were severe asthmatics that were treated with bronchial thermoplasty. Another postulated mechanism, now, of course, uh, and I don't know if that uh, reduction in airway smooth muscle mass is clinically responsible for the effect seen, but we do know that this is something that does happen. Another thing that does happen is that there is reduction in airway smooth muscle contraction in response to a noxious stimulus, i.e. acetylcholine. On the other hand, we don't have conclusive evidence that um, beta to agonist related relaxation is affected after bronchial thermoplasty. And finally, there is some evidence that um, BT can lead to reduced secretion of inflammatory mediators. And it seems that what happens here is that you know the, the heat energy destroys the diseased epithelium. And that leads to a generation of a less diseased one. This is sort of the postulated mechanism responsible for um, nitrogen cryospray that is coming out to be a possible uh, treatment modality for chronic bronchitis as well. So what's the current status of clinical evidence for bronchial thermoplasty? After some uh, preliminary studies, uh, I think the first big break uh, in the field of uh, BT was this AIR trial, the Asthma Intervention Research Trial, published in the New England Journal about 13 years ago now, that uh, looked at about 100 patients with moderate to severe persistent asthma. Everyone was on at least a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid and also an ALABA. And, uh, and this study showed that bronchial thermoplasty led to some reduction in both mild and severe exacerbations. 
But there were some issues too. First, there was an increase in early adverse events um, in the treatment group. And most of these were related to worsening of asthma symptoms. There were some hospitalizations as a consequence of that as well, but thankfully no deaths. And then there were other limitations, right? It was not a blinded study. It wasn't sham controlled. There was a potential for a strong placebo effect. And the subjects were thought to be not very sick. So some of those gaps were, you know, uh, hopefully filled by the RESA trial, the Research in Severe Asthma trial. So this was also published uh, about the same time uh, in the Blue Journal. And this was a much smaller study, about 30 patients, all with um, a more severe persistent asthma. Everyone was on a high-dose inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, they were all on a LABA as well, and their mean FEV1 was also lower than in the AIR trial group. And um, the, you know, the thermoplasty subjects uh, did show some significant improvements in, um, in AQLQ and ACQ scores at the 12th month mark, as well as in re rescue medication use. Um, but they didn't have any lasting changes in their PFTs. There was a small improvement in the FEV1 um, at the 22-week mark, but that wasn't sustained at the 12-month mark. Problems with this, there was once again a short-term increase in asthma-related symptoms, leading to seven hospitalizations um, versus none in the control group. And again, the study wasn't blinded or sham controlled. So that brings us to the ear 2 trial, which uh, it's amazing that this was published 10 years ago, and yet this is probably uh, sort of the, you know, the big basis, the, the main, the centerpiece of what we talk about when it comes to bronchial thermoplasty. Um, I wasn't at the Brigham back then, but uh, my esteemed colleague Elliot was, and uh, was actually a part of this trial as well. So this was a study on about 300 subjects, two to one randomized controlled trial, sham controlled, double blinded, and these were all adults with um, severe persistent asthma. They were all on a high dose inhaled corticosteroid as well as a LABA, and proven to be symptomatic with uncontrolled asthma despite that minimum requirement. So if you look at the, the, you know, the primary outcome and you examine that and some of the other um, outcomes at the 12-month mark, there are some statistics that are rather sobering, admittedly, even though I am here to, uh, to claim the, you know, the positive about bronchial thermoplasty. I think it's important to note that the primary outcome, which was an improvement in an integrated AQLQ score from baseline, Although it did get better by 1.35 um, in the treatment group, it got significantly better by 1.16 in the control group too. So there was, a, there was probably a big placebo effect going on over there. By the way, what is an integrated AQLQ score? It was the average of AQLQ scores at the 6, 9, and 12-month marks. You can see here that 64% of the controls had a clinically significant increase in their AQLQ score by more than 0.5, compared to 79% in the treatment group. So not very convincing, I would say. Other issues, there was no change in the FEV1 or in rescue medication use at the 12-month mark. And a huge majority of all the treated patients had respiratory adverse events too, though thankfully those were typically mild and subsided by the one-week mark. 8% of these got hospitalized compared to only 2% in the control group. And this was within the, the so-called treatment period or the perioperative period, which was defined as within the first six weeks after conclusion of the the third and last dose of bronchial thermoplasty. Most of these comprised asthma flares or segmental atelectasis um, issues. And then there were a few other um, episodes that led to hospitalizations as well. One patient had hemoptysis that led to need for embolization. One patient had an aspirated tooth. I like to claim that wasn't related to the thermoplasty, uh, but thankfully nobody died. So that that's sort of, uh, you know, the sobering statistics we have to deal with. But that's not the whole story. 
there were some positives that came out later on too. For patients who lived on to see the benefits, and all of them did, thankfully, there was a remarkable decrease in healthcare utilization metrics at the 12-month mark. This is excluding whatever happened in the first six weeks and only taking into account the 6- to 52-week time period. There was a major reduction in uh, number of severe exacerbations, fewer ED visits, and by fewer, I mean 84% fewer ED visits, and fewer days missed from work or school. Remember, this was a sham controlled study, so the controls didn't know that they didn't get the thermoplasty. So the big question then becomes, okay, well, sounds like um, early on there's a price to pay with bronchial thermoplasty, but then at the 12-month mark, things look on the up. Are the benefits of thermoplasty long-lasting? Do they last long enough to make uh, the upfront costs worthwhile? Because if you just look at the AIR-2 study, there's a footnote that mentions if you just combine all of the outcomes from day zero to the 12-month mark, most of those positive outcomes vanish. There is still a, an improved uh, signal for reduced ED visits in the thermoplasty group, but pretty much everything else doesn't look particularly convincing. Well, thankfully, now we have some additional data since the AIR-2 study came out in the form of these extension studies. These were performed, and this is a nice review published in Respiration only two years ago, uh, which really summarizes a lot of these studies. I, I, I think it's really helpful uh, for anybody who wants to look into bronchial thermoplasty further to, to really, um, you know, study this article. But, um, you know, the, the AIR studies um, treated subjects, the RISA study, the AIR-2 study, um, different investigators took the patients that were treated um, among these studies and followed them for up to five years and then compared their, uh, you know, outcomes of interest to the year before treatment on those same patients. And what you see is, I think first and foremost, very importantly, it seems like thermoplasty continues to be a safe treatment modality even several years out. There were no deleterious effects of that that came apparent, that became apparent later on, none of that. The FEV1 remains stable in all these, or most of these patients. And, um, and in particular, I want to draw your attention to, you know, the AIR-2 studies, 44% um, decrease in exacerbations and 78% decrease in emergency room visits this far out compared to those same patients' own experiences in the year preceding bronchial thermoplasty. Since the FDA approved this um, treatment modality way back in 2010, the year that AIR-2 came out, uh, there was another study done, uh, a real-world study called the PASS-2, or post-FDA approval study. This was just uh, an observational prospective study looking at patients who were undergoing bronchial thermoplasty, and these were on average sicker. Uh, than the cohort that you will find in the AIR-2 um, study. So these were on average older, and they had a higher proportion of oral corticosteroid use as well. And you can see that at least three years out, there was stable FEV1 and a significant decrease in severe exacerbations, ED visits, as well as hospitalizations. Now, another question that comes to mind is, does it all make economic sense? What's the cost effectiveness of bronchial thermoplasty? Um, how expensive is the procedure to begin with? Well, um, Zane and others uh, published this in the Journal of Asthma about four years ago now. And uh, this is a modeling study. This was a Markov model. So this isn't, you know, this wasn't done alongside the AIR-2 trial, for instance. Um, so take it with a grain of salt because this is a simulation based uh, cost effectiveness analysis. But what they claimed was that um, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio for bronchial thermoplasty out at 10 years would only be around 30,000 per gain in quality. Of course, that's amazing. It's better than what it is for dialysis. And 
the ICER would go up to, you know, greater than 50,000, although I, I would argue perhaps 100,000 is uh, the commonly accepted willingness to pay threshold in this day and age, but it would, uh, it would become less cost effective nonetheless if you didn't meet certain assumptions, including what was the baseline probability of exacerbation over the course of a year uh, for this severe asthma cohort, or, and also what was the total cost of bronchial thermoplasty. You compare that with the cost effectiveness of omalizumab, um, the, you know, the relevant study, the one study that I could find was published uh, in 2010. So of course, this could be outdated now, and I don't know if omalizumab has since become significantly cheaper. But at least back then, uh, the authors claimed that the incremental cost effectiveness ratio was tenfold higher almost compared to what it was for bronchial thermoplasty. And even higher if you only took the, the patients who would respond, the responder rate. Now, what do the expert guidelines say about bronchial thermoplasty? We've seen a bit of an evolution of sorts and perhaps a little bit of stalling too. In 2014, the ERS and ATS joint guidelines um, recommended that thermoplasty should only be performed in the context of IRB approved clinical studies. I will tell you that did lead to many insurance companies denying coverage on the basis of that, uh, you know, that statement. Um, the next year, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology sought to correct that or change course a little bit. They said that carefully selected patients could benefit and that uh, specifically mentioned that insurers should provide coverage. Um, so that, that was directly, you know, of course, directed at uh, the problems that we were facing with, for some of these patients. In 2017, the GINA guidelines incorporated this in the step five of therapy and graded the relevant evidence to grade B and said you should consider it in selected patients despite, um, you know, who have uncontrolled asthma despite recommended guideline-based therapy. The most recent guidelines from GINA are, you know, fairly similar. So I will, I will end here to just to wrap up I hope I have um, shown you that bronchial thermoplasty doesn't seem to improve lung function tests. It maybe modestly improves AQLQ, although there seems to be a huge placebo effect. It's hard to say whether it's the bronchoscopy or the bronchial thermoplasty that improves AQLQ. But it does seem to majorly reduce healthcare utilization and costs, something that seems to hold true even five years out. And for all we know, perhaps longer than that. Again, I want to draw our attention to the fact that asthma-related healthcare costs are exorbitant, and the vast majority are due to severe or poorly controlled asthma. So the way I see it, bronchial thermoplasty offers an attractive promise of a long-lasting alternative, perhaps even a once-in-a-lifetime kind of a treatment alternative, for some cases that can be particularly challenging, such as severe or refractory asthma despite maximal medical therapy, um, or, or patients that are struggling with affordability or inhaler technique, uh, patients that for one reason or another are struggling with compliance issues with adhering to the prescribed medical therapy, something to consider. Now, do we know everything about thermoplasty that we should? No, we don't. We are far from that. Um, as one example of that, we need more data on predictive biomarkers of bronchial thermoplasty response. What kind of a phenotype or what kind of an endotype of asthma really ought to benefit from thermoplasty and which patients should we spare the trouble and potentially the harm of bronchial thermoplasty, we don't really know. I coded this TASMA study, it's a very small study on just 40 patients, severe asthmatics though, uh, with the primary outcome being, um, you know, change in air with smooth muscle mass. But one of the things that they claim they found um, is that higher baseline IgE and eosinophil levels seem to correlate with clinical improvement in the form of improvement in AQLQ score at six months. So. Perhaps. I think it's an exciting signal, but we really need to study it more. Wouldn't it be great if we could uh, not try to paint uh, everything with the same one brush of thermoplasty, but really found uh, 
specific phenotypes that stood to benefit. So I'll stop here, and uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Elliot Israel take over, and, uh, and then I suppose we'll answer questions together at the end. Thanks so much. Um, Majid, thank you for a really very nice review of the data regarding bronchial thermoplasty. And so um, I've been asked to take the con position about the use of bronchial thermoplasty. So I'm going to put a little bit of a different spin um, on the data that you've presented. Um, so bronchial thermoplasty and asthma, and Majid really did a beautiful job about talking about the impact of asthma and also beautiful illustrations of how bronchial thermoplasty works in terms of thinking about it theoretically. And so the rationale, as he reviewed with you, is the application of energy and subsequent heat to the airway under the presumption that airway smooth muscle mass is reduced, which at least in the animal studies and the CT scan studies actually have suggested that there is a reduction in airway smooth muscle. And as you noted, it was approved by the FDA in April 2010 for the treatment of severe persistent asthma in patients who are 18 years old or older. So what we know, um, I think uh, Majid actually didn't emphasize this, but we know bronchial thermoplasty does not appear to cause permanent airway scarring. That had been one of the issues. The concern was that there might be a decline in FEV1 or because you were getting rid of the airway smooth muscle, there might be a change. It doesn't appear to ha that that doesn't happen. It doesn't reduce bronchodilator reversibility, as he talked about as well. And at the end of one year, as Majid pointed out, more patients, 79% versus 64% with BT, had an AQLQ improvement of more than 0.5 than those who underwent a sham bronchoscopy. The mean improvement, as Majid reviewed with you, was small. It was 0.19. We normally think of about a 0.5 as being the greater um, effect. Um, so it was a very small, for the, for the population studied, it was, it was very small. What we do know, and um, that we have three bronchoscopies, and actually the Zane study suggested that the cost of those is actually more like $30,000, and actually if it's done in the OR, which is what's being done now, the costs are more like sixty or $70,000. So about, six, um, about three to four times what the Zane study talked about. Um, and we know that there's about a 10% periprocedure hospitalization with a three-and-a-half-fold increased risk for hospitalization related to thermoplasty. So is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, is it really worthwhile doing this? Let's really talk about what happened and what's, what's really going on. So what else do we think we know? Um, so this is a, Majid actually talked about the study. This is a study following people for five years after the bronchial thermoplasty. And what it looked at was the symptoms, or this was the subjects with severe exacerbations, the percent of them, right, um, before, reported before the thermoplasty, and then what they reported after the thermoplasty for up to five years of the thermoplasty. And this is the, the rates of severe exacerbations, and you can see the rates here are about 0.85, and they got reduced to about 0.45, so about a 40, 45 percent reduction, and that's what patients continue to report all the way out for five years. And so you'd say, wow, I should do this. I can get a 45% reduction in exacerbations compared to what patients reported beforehand. But what actually happens in placebo-controlled trials when you take severe asthmatics and you put them on placebo and follow them for a year? These are, the th these are three studies, and I can actually quote you another five or six. Um, the DREAM study, which was using anti-IL-5, the Mensa study, which used anti-IL-5, the QUEST study, which used anti-IL-413. The yellow lines here are the, what the patients reported in terms of their exacerbations pre-study. The green lines are what patients reported in exacerbations post-study. What you can see is, this is placebo. This is not the patients who got the drug. This is patients who were just, they didn't undergo a bronchoscopy. They didn't go under three bronchoscopies and go to the OR for their bronchoscopies. They just got an injection once a, once a month, right? And on the placebo, depending on the study, they had a 35 50%, or 65% decrease in their exacerbations compared to what they had reported on entering the study. So there's a huge placebo effect. We've known about this for a long, long time. This is what happens when you take severe asthmatics and put, put them in a study and then follow them afterwards. 
um, they continue to have these reduced rates of exacerbations, and especially if you went to the OR three times or went and had a bronchoscopy three times after this. A matter of fact, if you look at studies, this is a surgical trial that included long-term follow-up of controls and shows persistent effects in both groups. This was an arthroscopic surgery and people complaining about this ability from their knees, placebo versus the surgical. And you can look for these out to two years, and what you can see is that the placebo effect persists, despite the fact that these patients had nothing done except to going to the OR. So there's a really large placebo effect when you have these interventions. So, and when you look at controlled trials, um, and you look at the patients and the ED visits, um, and you look at the controls, so um, Majid pointed out to us that compared to um, how they started, um, patients had a dramatic decrease in their rates of exacerbations or their emergency room visits. But if you follow the control group, and this is what was shown here, the green lines of the control group after bronchial thermoplasty, you can see that the control group and the intervention group do not differ at all as long as they follow the controls. They stopped following the controls at three years, but when they left them off, there was absolutely no difference in the emergency room visits between the patients who'd been, uh, who had not gotten the bronchial thermoplasty and those who had gotten the bronchial thermoplasty. So when we have controls, we don't see a difference between these patients. There's no difference between BT and exacerbations. Same thing here, bronchial thermoplasty and controls. No difference for exacerbations, no difference for ED visits. There's no difference, again, for respiratory adverse events. Again, this is what it looks like. So, so there's no follow-up in the controls. The low, farthest out they've gone is three years. When they went out and when they looked at that, there wasn't any difference between the interventions and the controls. When follow-up's available, there is no improvement after bronchial thermoplasty. What else do we think we know? Well, I think as Majid pointed out, healthcare utilization in the year of bronchial thermoplasty, post hoc, non-pre-specified analysis, suggested that there was a decrease in severe exacerbations and unscheduled physician visits and emergency room visits and in hospitalizations. This is what the data showed when you excluded, as Majid pointed out, when you excluded the perioperative um, points. Only one of these, and this is a post hoc analysis, it wasn't pre-specified, but only, and only one of these even looked like it was significant. However, what was buried in the study, and actually Majid pointed this out, is that when you looked at the entire, and we, we are normally not allowed to say we only will look at a specific part, we will exclude the fact that some people died or some people had hospitalizations, we'll exclude all that and we'll only look at the period after, uh, afterwards. So over the entire study period, severe exacerbations per subject in the PT, BT group were 54% and in the sham group were 40, 46%. So even though these patients had undergone a sham bronchoscopy, the ones who had BT had higher rates of exacerbations. ED visits, there was in the BT group, there's 8.4%. In the sham group, there's 15, 15%, a lower rate in the BT group. And respiratory-related hospitalizations, there were 10%, 10.5% in the BT group, 5% 5 in the non-bronchoscopy group, in the, uh, non, in the sham group that had undergone bronchoscopy. And you need to remember the sham here was a bronchoscopy. So the rates of hospitalizations, respiratory adverse events, and ED events, some of them in the sham group are related to the fact that these people had undergone bronchoscopy. So that's another big issue here. So the comparison, you're not normally going to be taking the controls and doing a bronchoscopy and saying, oops, you ended up in the emergency room after the bronchoscopy. We'll count that as a, broncho as a control um, effect. So it's even more exaggerated. But let's look at what happens when we add these things back up. So if we put back in the excluded rates of severe exacerbations, there are more exacerbations in the BT group. So that decrease that you saw, that didn't really happen if you really include what happens when you do the procedure. The same thing's true for the unscheduled physician office visits. There's still a difference for the emergency room visits, so that no longer becomes significant. And for the hospitalizations, there's actually an increase in hospitalizations in the BT group compared to the non-BT group. So all those effects that we've talked about, and Majid pointed this out, all those effects really aren't there when you count the way you're supposed to count, which is from the time you did the procedure onward. You can't say, oh, no, 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 forget about the, the fact that my procedure itself is quite morbid. Don't really look at that. 
let's forget about that and let's just look at what happens way afterwards. And as we pointed out, what happens way afterwards isn't any different than what happens in controls. What about the acute side effects? So as Majid pointed out, pneumonia, atelectasis, bronchial bleeding, and hospitalization. That's what was reported in the control trials. What gets reported in the case reports for other things that happen to people with, um, uh, with bronchial thermoplasty? Hemoptysis, atelectasis, pneumonia. There's a case report of a mediastinal hematoma and a bloody pleural effusion after anticoagulation for a pulmonary embolus thought to be secondary to a pseudoaneurysm, so well after the procedure. Lung abscess, bronchial polyps, bronchial cysts, and an attribution, an attribution of bronchiectasis. These, not are, these are not benign things. So what are the alternatives without the same morbidity? So remember, these studies were done in 2010. There were no biologics except for potentially anti-IGE. Um, and anti-IGE reduces exacerbations by 50% in qualifying patients. Um, but that's actually a long time ago before we thought or knew how to endotype, as Ms. Jeed mentioned, how to endotype patients and how to think about patients that might be more responsive. We know that anti-IL-5 and anti-IL-413 therapy reduce exacerbations by more than 50% in those with type 2 asthma, and that's compared to a control. That's after you already subtract out the control effect and the placebo effect. So when we look at these anti-IL-5 therapies and these anti-IL-413 effect, effects, we're not looking at the reduction compared to um, prior to being the study. If you looked at the reduction compared to prior to being the study, the reductions would be 80% or more. We're talking about compared to placebo, which is not what we're talking about when we talk about bronchial thermoplasty. So what we know from the only head-to-head -head com uh, comparison study available, which is the AIR-2, which is the one-year trial compared with sham, BT did not reduce exacerbations and numerically increased them. BT did not reduce and possibly increased hospitalizations. And in secondary analyses, ED visits appeared reduced, but it's really hard to explain that considering the data for ongoing hospitalizations. So as Mazid pointed out, um, the international ERS ATS guidelines on the definition, evaluation, and treatment of severe asthma, which include Dr. Castro, who was the first author on the AIR trial, we recommend that bronchial thermoplasty is performed in adults with severe asthma only in the context of an institutional review board approved independent systematic registry or a clinical study. Strong recommendation based on a low quality of evidence. The NAAPP was asked to address the effects of bronchial thermoplasty and its recommendation regarding bronchial thermoplasty. Those guidelines have not yet been um, released, but they the preliminary recommendations are out, and those preliminary recommendations are the same as the ERS task force. They recommend against bronchial thermoplasty with low quality evidence. So in conclusion, BT is a novel procedure. It reduces airway smooth muscle. In direct comparison to a sham, its benefits are unclear. The procedure itself results in hospitalizations in 8 to 10% of patients. Long-term follow-up doesn't suggest permanent damage. Only long-term follow-up with controls does not suggest any benefit. Some patients are more tr report dramatic improvements, but there's a dramatic placebo effect. We need to work on identifying, as Majid has pointed out, we really need to work on identifying whether there's a clear subgroup of patients that responds to BT. I would take significant exception to the study that's in press. Um, those patients are one of the ones that I'd most um, most seriously recommend not undergo BT. Patients with, high, with um, type 2 inflammation now have serious alternatives, which we know work compared to placebo. Um, and it, in my mind, it would not be fair to put those patients through a BT when you know you have an intervention that you can actually make work. So I'll stop there. Happy to kind of have a discussion about thinking about BT. But I think the bottom line is there probably are some patients who, where this really seems to have a dramatic effect. We need to figure out some way to figure out what, what those patients are, um, and, that, and that's, that's the work, I think, that's ahead of us. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to both of you. Come uh, join us up front at the table, and we'll take some questions. I hope uh, some will be submitted uh, from members of the uh, audience via... Um, let me just scroll up here via um, texting. Uh, I, I, here, here's the uh, phone number to text your questions to, if you would.
So I, I, I'm impressed. Two very convincing speakers and, uh, and presentations. I thought that was a terrific uh, overview. And uh, where to begin? I thought we might speculate about the mechanism uh, by which uh, bronchial thermoplasty has an effect, assuming that it has an effect, beneficial effect in some persons. And um, as a skeptic, a priority going into the development of this procedure, it struck me that the treatment is applied to uh, major, relatively central airways. With the, uh, the catheter, we don't have access to small airways and bronchioles. My understanding has always been that part of a major part of asthma has been small and peripheral airway involvement. Can we speculate together in those who do seem to derive a benefit? How does that happen when we've addressed only the central uh, airways with our therapy? Majid, you want, uh, either it would be I'll, great. I'll Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's great. Can you make sure the microphone's on? I'm sorry, that has to be, the switch has to be pulled forward. There's an on off switch. Let me... Yeah, John, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good. And I'll just, yeah. I'll get closer. No, it's a great question. So um, I have come across some studies that show very interestingly that even distally, there seem to be some histopathologic effects of the bronchial thermoplasty. And interestingly, even that right middle lobe, which is typically spared, tends to show some of the same changes that we talked about in essence suggesting that this heat energy probably gets dissipated, that's my best guess, uh, but maybe there's some other like paracrine mechanisms or something else that are also at play. Great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think we, you know, I think you're right. We think that 80% um, um, of the resistance to um, in, in asthma is actually peripheral airways. And so, which is another reason to wonder about what the mechanism might be that this is really happening. Um, I, I think that maybe changes in the epithelium, but again, how do those get peripherally? I, I'm just not sure. Um, but, but I think we, we do know that there are changes centrally, clearly, um, with bronchial thermoplasty. Can, can you help me with the question about the evidence regarding bronchial hyperreactivity? Do, uh, uh, is that something that changes as a result of bronchial thermoplasty? Do the airways broadly become less twitchy as a result of the intervention? Do we have that evidence? So, so in, the, in the uncontrolled trial, um, so the, there was no measure of bronchial th thermoplasty in the, in the controlled trials. In the uncontrolled trials, there was a subgroup, I believe, where they looked at methacholine reactivity. And, and there was a reduction compared to baseline. Um, but again, not w w without a control. Um, but that, that, that suggests maybe that there might be some reduction in, in bronchial reactivity. Again, without a control, it's a little hard to know for sure. Majid, am I right? In the unpublished study, the TASMA study, they didn't find a change in bronchial hyperreactivity. Does that sound right? Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. So it's too, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hmm. It is a small study, uh, but yes, they didn't, they couldn't find a signal to it. Uh, okay. They did find that the irvis smooth muscle decreased appreciably. That, that was their primary outcome that the study was supposedly powered to show, right. and they did find that. So they found smaller, I just happened to look at this uh, study, and they found a reduction in airway smooth muscle mass, but didn't find that that correlated with the response, right? That the responders weren't the ones who had the greatest decrease in airway smooth yeah, muscle talking, mass. Yeah, so 40 subjects total. Um, but uh, but that's uh, that's that's exactly right, and it makes me wonder, just like Elliot said, whether the more important mechanism here is not that uh, you know that's just something we see. That's one of the things that the heat energy does, but perhaps the replacement of the diseased epithelium is really the the thing that is at play. Who knows? 
One of the members of the audience uh, asked or suggested as a possibility, do we know anything about changes in airway innervation? Is it possible that this is affecting uh, uh, airway function through heat, heat effect on airway nerves? I guess uh, sensory or motor, I imagine. It's an excellent question. And um, you know, the interesting thing is for bronchial thermoplasty, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the way we do this is we, we take all the airways distal to the main stem bronchi and the trachea, obviously. Of course, we're trying to get as close as possible to the smaller <coughs> airways as much as bronchoscopically possible. It's a small airway disease, as we know. Interestingly, there is a different kind of um, interventional pulmonary intervention available, uh, becoming fat, you know, quickly available, hopefully will be around here soon too, which is TLD or total lung denervation, uh, which has shown some promise in patients with COPD. And that's where you are delivering energy at the level of the main stem bronchi. And the idea there is to affect the parasympathetic nerves. And that seems to benefit patients with a relatively similar, but in many ways dissimilar pathophysiology. Uh, one more question uh, from members of the audience. And I'll let you guess who might have submitted this based on the question. It has to do with mechanism. And uh, uh, the point is made that we think that some airway inflammation is due to airway constriction. Do we know if airway inflammation is altered by bronchial thermoplasty? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of studies regarding airway inflammation. Well, other than this mention that you'd made, Majid, earlier about uh, epithelial regeneration after bronchial thermoplasty, the, these biopsy studies from the TASMA. Um, that's the, I think uh, that's what one assumes, but we don't have any direct evidence that I have seen uh, as to whether or not it leads to a, a true reduction in you know, in inflammation as measured in those proper terms. Question. We do see non-TH2 type severe asthma. Normal IgE, no uh, eosinophilia, maybe even some neutrophilic inflammation. Would such a candidate with severe asthma be, it was such a patient with severe asthma, such a phenotype, be a candidate in your mind for bronchial thermoplasty? You both get to answer this. So remember, I, I have significant concerns about whether we really have an effect. Um, so I think that the type of patient that I would consider is a patient where there is actually not much evidence of inflammation. So neither eosinophilic nor neutrophilic. Um, you're not going to fix bronchiectasis or bronchiectatic-like um, physiology by going in and, and ablating the smooth muscle. And I think, and theoretically, I think those patients actually might be at the greatest risk for adverse effects with atelectasis and, and things like that. But I think we do see a very small group of patients where there continues to be significant symptoms and there really isn't any evidence of airway inflammation. And there you have to postulate that maybe a big piece of what's going on is related to muscle and maybe those patients might be the patients that might get some benefit by ablating their airway smooth muscle but that's a really small group and again you know one wants to think that wants, wants to make sure that one has and if you look at the gina guidelines the the caveat um, is always that you've maximized and used all the other therapies including in in those cases for the non-eosinophilic patients um, things like anticholinergic therapy and consider macrolides and things like that all before you've um, really referred those patients to even consider the bronchial thermoplasty. And even in the, um, the upcoming guidelines for the NEPP, they, they really talk about have, having to have a patient who really understands what the trade-off is with bronchial thermoplasty and still wants to have a bronchial thermoplasty, even understanding the, the potential immediate risks of the thermoplasty. You know, I will say there's much to be discovered. Um, now, 
with the caveat that it doesn't mean much. I have personally taken care of a patient that was sort of that phenotype with a neutrophilic predominance who seemed to do well <coughs> during the one and a half years or so that I followed her. Uh, but that could be so many things, and we know one of those could be simply placebo effect too. I think there's a lot that uh, we need to recognize that there is much to be known about this uh, therapy. When we look at the AIR-2 trial, which uh, appropriately deserves all the attention because it's the only you know, randomized and sham controlled study that we have, I think while it is... Um, unusual for them to describe the treatment period and the post-treatment period separately, the trajectory of where things are going compared to controls in that sham controlled trial is definitely something that draws attention. I think it's appropriate. It's, it's positive. It's promising. It's not completely convincing. And I think what we need next is longer term follow-up side by side with controls similar to one study that Elliot talked about um, where they looked at the air um, study, not the air two study, but the air study. What we need to do is for this air two sham controlled study, we need to replicate something like it and then see, like I said, the big question is, you know, are the upfront costs worthwhile, right? Like Elliot said as well. Is the juice worth the squeeze? I think the way the AIR-2 study cohort went during the latter part of the study period between the treated group and the control group, it's definitely promising because remember, these were still controlled. They were still sham controlled. And we saw that in the form of the AQLQ where there wasn't much to choose from between the two groups. And yet the treated group seemed to go in a unified direction, a positive direction with reduced ED visits, hospitalizations, days lost from work and, or school. So we need to know longer term whether that is something that is sustained and we need to have an appropriate control for that. Similarly, we don't really know where things stand in terms of what phenotypes or endotypes stand to benefit. And very importantly, like Elliot said, which ones could potentially be harmed the most, and that is something that requires more work. Is there any, uh, a question, any uh, FEV1 cutoff that you would use in, <coughs> excuse me, patient selection? The, the general, you know, almost all the patients that were studied um, had an F, actually all the ones that were in the trials had an FEV1 greater than 50% predicted, um, and the general kind of well, thumb is probably more towards 60% predicted, but yeah, that's exactly right. Very good. And uh, is there ever an occasion when one might consider a second bronchial thermoplasty? Has that uh, ever been done, looked at, conceivable? <laughs> is there a rationale for repeating the procedure? You know, that's the, that's an, uh, it comes to my mind frequently because I think, again, need to have longer follow-up. Um, some people seem to do really well that, you know, very far out. But, of course, with all the caveats of, you know, looking at observational studies like Elliot very nicely articulated, um, it is plausible to my mind that whatever we can accomplish through some heat treatment is bound to get reversed uh, unless we cause permanent scarring, which we know we don't. But does that happen? We're yet to see. I haven't come across any patient like that so far. Uh, I want to come back just uh, in terms of point of evidence about uh, airway inflammation. We, we have exhaled nitric oxide as a measure, at least, of eosinophilic inflammation. Do we know? whether a bronchial thermoplasty has an impact on exhaled NO. Was that looked at at any of these studies, or these were done prior to widespread availability of... No, right. I don't think so. No. Right, 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 right. But definitely worth, uh, worth looking into, yeah. Good. Well, unless there are other questions, I, I've had mine answered, and, and in such a thorough, thoughtful way. I very much appreciate both of your thoughtful presentations today, and it gives us, if nothing else, a lot of food for thought. So thank you.
very, very much. Thank Thanks. you for organizing this, Chris. Okay. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Bye now.